Okay, everybody, thank you for, for coming. We are recording right now. So we'll just go ahead and start. Um, Annette Bjorling is a, a native German. She first studied harp at the music school of Heidelberg. She has also studied with Rudiger Oppermann and Park Stickney. She holds a very interesting master's degree. It's in cultural science and education with focus on music and theater from the University of Hildesheim. Her website, and you, you really need to visit her website, it's very well professionally done. It's very impressive. Um, there you will see her performing in a duo called Duo Controverso with her husband, Kurt. They have a klezmer duo that is outstanding. You, it's, it's unbelievable. It's the, she does all kinds of things to, to back up his wonderful clarinet playing and it's I, th I sat and listened to, to it for about an hour the last time I checked it out it was very compelling okay so she also performs as a soloist but she performs with a tap dancer from the Chicago Tap Theater so as you can see her biography is unlike any other teacher that we've had on Harp Teachers Gathering and we're delighted to hear what she has to say about Bernard André's friandise, which means sweets. Her handout was sent to you a couple days ago. It's delectable. It's sweet and delectable. And uh, if you don't have it, I think that Gretchen or uh, Gretchen Monson is our moderator, and she or I will provide it for you in the chat if you need it. And questions should be asked in the chat, and Gretchen will keep track of those. So without any further blah, blah on my part, Annette, take it away. Thank you very much. Yeah, in addition to the nice, very nice intro I just got from Mary, thank you. I wanted to tell you a little bit about my teaching bio. I started playing harp at age 13, and then pretty soon thereafter, maybe two or three years afterwards, I had a girl in my school ask me if I could teach harp lessons. And I thought, I don't know, I can try. And I tried and I liked it so much. And I just realized I'm an intuitive teacher. Whatever I can do, I can also teach. And I really enjoyed harp teaching. And since then, of course, I have learned much more playing harp and also much more teaching harp. I had various private teachers. I went to many different harp conventions in Europe and here in the US and learned a lot and I'm still learning and I'm really enjoying. I'm enjoying teaching any, any individual students, seeing their progress and helping them with it. And currently I have a group of fairly advanced students with whom I meet about once a month for a big ensemble and it is so much fun. And yes, yeah, so this is my, my teaching. And one of my teaching tools is finding good good books, good um, sources. And one of my favorite composers for harp teaching material is Bernard Andres, whom I already encountered. Um, his books I already encountered while learning harp. And I met him in person in May of 2009. There was a three-day workshop slash masterclass in Hannover at the music school there. And one of my former harp teachers, Isabel Moraton, organized that. And I was fortunate enough that I could fly there. I, I lived already here by then, but um, I was flying back to Germany for that course. And it was just amazing to see him in person, to, to see the way how he teaches and how he's engaged in music. And he was so inspiring. And that also helped me then for the coming weeks and years to help inspire my students. And uh, today's book I selected from his is Friandis, which I just discovered myself several years ago. And this is not my not only my favorite etude book by Andres, it's my favorite etude book from all the etude books I've so far um, encountered by anyone. I I like the that it's so nice and varied. It has a total of 67 pieces. So those of you who have, have the book already, you're welcome to, to take it and then read along when we have something or use your hand out. Um, so 67 pieces vary from easy to advanced. 
and have different um, points for what 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 is important to learn and uh, yeah different different techniques and and different focuses and I like that that you can use it basically any level I mean the difficult pieces maybe you wouldn't use with beginners but maybe you would play them really slowly also with intermediate players and advanced players and students can still revisit the easy pieces because it's always nice to revisit and focus on something else and see how it works now and maybe do some variations to it. Also nice is for my purposes um, and all my students who are lever harp students um, that the complete book is playable on lever harp and you can even play it on a small herb, but some pieces you would need to rearrange then that you play in higher octaves so that it fits. But on a definitely 36 level herb, but even 26 level herb, most of it is playable. Um, to the content, which is in, in French, so it helps if you know French, but even if you don't, I'm sure there's so many um, translation tools meanwhile. So it starts with a set of etudes who use either two fingers or three fingers or four fingers. And then it moves on to interval exercises. Then it has a chapter of hands playing either alternating consecutively or crossing over each other. And then there's a chapter with blocked and broken chords. And then he has a very short chapter on rhythmical exercises on special effects. And then the last chapter is he focuses on crossing scales, but he basically then revisits all the other subjects and has what I think real pieces in there, not just etudes, they're all little nice pieces. Then as to use this book, there are several ways. You could just play from the first piece through the last piece, um, or you could focus on a particular chapter and play that chapter in chronological order, or you just choose random little delectables from all over. And what I like to do is um, put groups together, especially in the first chapter where it has, um, where in the two or three or four finger etudes, he has first a section where all the pieces lift off in between groups. And then a, ch a section where all the pieces connect. And I like to do, choose one of the connecting pieces and one of the lift off pieces to show students. Yeah, both are valid techniques and depending what's needed. And then I like to group them by lever position because with many lever hubs like, oh, if I have the lever already in C or A minor, then I want to stay in that. So I put two pieces together, which are in these, in these keys. And that's, that's just a fun little thing. You don't have to do it that way. Anyway, find out what's the best for you or your students and or your students to, to pick the order. I had one of my students who went through the book already twice. The third time she went through it from the very last piece to the very first piece. And that was also an interesting experience for both of us. So fun, fun to work with this. Now I wanted to go into some examples. In the first chapter is the two finger section. And so he starts first with the lift off. He doesn't specify. It's just assumed that he means one, two, one, two, one, two. That seems sort of the obvious if you say two fingers. I discovered either by accident or whatever on <laughs> one of my students at one time, oh, but you could also use two and three, or you can use three and four, or one and three, or two and four. And then it's just a matter of the intention. He said, okay, you play the whole piece now with two and three, or with three and four. That again depends on how advanced the student is, how comfortable they would be using other fingers than, than one and two. Or what we could do the first time we play through, we only use one and two. And then if we revisit it a year or two later, that section of the book or the whole book, then we can say, Oh, well, how about using different fingers? So just as an example, I choose the very first piece in the book, number one. Those who don't have the hand out, I'll just hold it to you briefly so you get an idea. I'm very low tech, so I have no idea how to share a screen. Therefore, I share a book. But now I need my hands for playing. So this is the one where you lift off.
so on and then you can switch to fingers. And then as a companion piece, which uh, when I follow that idea of I have one lift off piece and one connecting piece per week, per lesson, I have one which goes very nicely with this because this is in the same level position is number eight. Which in the handout I have annotated here, I just show you some of the blank things. So this theoretically, you're supposed to connect all the way through. Although he, again, doesn't give an exact answer, example. And you need to just see, there are some portions where you just cannot literally connect because you need to replace the finger somewhere else or it's too far a jump. And then I just tell my students, so just connect like it's a tie, like it's a, um, a whole phrasing marking. So you, you tie four measures together. So even if you have to lift off a little bit in between, just think you would take it all in one breath or in one tie. So two fingers all connected as much as possible. And very often, not always, but very often Andres in his pieces, beginner pieces, etude-like pieces, or here in this book in the etudes, uses, composes it in a way that after a while the roles of the hand, hands change if they had a distinctive role. So in this case, we had eight notes in the right hand and quarter notes in the left hand, and then halfway through the piece that changes. And as, as soon the left hand gets more involved, um, that might be more difficult for some students. So that's then also, you can slow it down for that section or see that that's a special focus working on. And the next chapter then is the ex exercises with three finger groupings, which I treat the same way as, as the two finger grouping. So I group sometimes two pieces together. I make sure they know the difference between the lift off and the crossing. And for the more advanced students, I then switch eventually to two, three, and four instead of one, two, and three, depending how big the intervals are and how, how the piece works. One piece in which it works really nicely is number 16. And number 16 is one of those little cannons. And I, in generally, love playing canons, be it little folk melodies or little composed pieces, because that's just really great, really great teaching too, nice for the brain, nice challenge for the students. And depending how far they are, they can play one hand and then another student or I play the other hand and we play in, in groupings. Or when they're advanced enough, you will have them play both hands. So this is number 16, a little canon. Oh. Levers. Three fingers, lift off. That's the end. So you see, it's fairly easy. But it sounds really cute. It sounds really attractive. And that's really the whole the whole book and many of his other works, Andre's other works are like that. That even if it's for beginners, even if it's fairly easy technical, it just sounds very compelling immediately. And basically all my students love him and love working with the pieces. So then the chapter continues with four finger exercises in the same idea. And there, of course, I don't have any alternations. This is just the four fingers. And if you have the work, you can take a look at it yourself. Otherwise, if you don't yet have the work, I really recommend, and I hope after this session, you will be interested in, in buying it. And I included a link in the handout where you can buy it at Melodies. The next 
Then big chapter is about the interval exercises. And here he also starts easier and becomes more involved. So he starts with seconds and thirds and then fourths and fifths and goes all the way to octaves. And then later in the chapter, he also mixes different intervals and sometimes the hands to different things. So in the example I have here, this is number 39 in the book. Here again, he gives no indication about fingering. So um, the normal way for six, as we probably all learn, is one and three. But for more advanced students and for fun, you can switch to two and four. So I keep it with three and one first. And then we switch roles again. And so on, we get an idea for that. The next chapter is the one where the hands are more involved with each other, either alternating playing, consecutive playing, crossing playing. And I like this one a lot. It's really great. Um, most of those and most of those etudes exercises are written fairly fast, indicated by 16 notes. But if you have beginner students who cannot play it in an official 16, just slow it down. You can still very nicely. same idea and it doesn't matter which tempo it is. Yeah, the idea. It's, it's very nice. Again, it's one of those really nice sounding pieces. Here again, you can switch to other fingers if you like. Oh, and because I said you can play it fast or slow, this, if not already before, would be a really great time to mention metronome and um, introduce metronome playing to, to students, or if you have already revisit metronome playing with them. So you set a small, slow tempo first and slowly increase it or try it at different speeds. All those, all those ways you practice with a metronome. Um, the next example is number 54. Um, this is the one where we now have crossing triads where the hands cross, so it's, Left, right, left, right. Those are obviously always lift off in between. It gives you enough time to look at hand position and relaxation and all that. It's really nice. Again, if you want to switch to four, three, two. This is nicely doable without a thumb. Next example I have here is number 52, which we're now in the, in the section with all four fingers playing little alternating groupings. Again, this could be done slowly, nicely, still sounds nice. Or you go it fast. probably similar to other like just exercises we did, but it sounds nice. It's a nice little etude, which also could work at its own little piece. The last one in this chapter I wanted to show you is number 55. And not so much about the piece, but there's something else I wanted to point out. So this is now we are in full chords and hence um, switching again. So we have a G, big G seventh chord. <laughs> And 
it. So, um, those of you who have the handout can see, otherwise I will show it just there because there's just pencil and the hands out it's in nice colors. I love working with colors, but only on my iPad. On the printed sheet music, I still work with pencil. So I made a note here that this little grouping should be octava, a base, an octave down, which I'm sure, I'm 99% sure that's what he meant. It just didn't get printed like that because the whole section of the, of the groups is like, the hands cross over each other and you have a grouping of four. The way how it's printed, it would be, which can also be a great exercise, both hands playing in the same octave, but this is really the only part in this piece. So I'm sure he meant it an octave lower. So the hands cross over that. And that is something which I discover a lot in, in some books more and other books less that we change something, either because it seems to be an obvious printing mistake or because it's something which either I or my student think, oh, it might be sounding better that way, or we have to adjust an octave because we have a small harp and the low notes don't fit them in. So there's many reasons to adjust something to printed music. The most, most common thing we change is fingers because finger numbers are just, um, something very subjective or fitting on, on each student's needs. So that's the thing I guess I change more often. But sometimes we change chords or left-hand notes because we just think, oh, this doesn't sound so nice. So I want to just, if you don't do this already, just encourage you all, like don't take any printed music as absolute, see if and what could be changed. When we do that, uh, when I do that with my students, I always tell them first, okay, let's first see what's printed before we change it and then think about why, why do we change it? What are the reasons for changing? But first see what's printed. And I just think that's also a very nice way to handle music. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and then because I already sort of left the subject of the only the book, I am now going even farther away from the book completely because I'm doing something which Mary asked me to do. I am using a construction here for my reading of sheet music. I, a, I use my iPad for read, to read sheet music. And this one is attached to my harp. So I have it immediately here on my fingertips so I can easily play and then just reach over. My street cannot see right now. So then I can just reach over with my left hand and, and turn pages, which makes it really nice. It just blocks off the face depending where it is so you have to really know like okay what is what is the best angle for the harp or so and depending what the audience is some members of the audience just cannot see you it's still smaller as a full man has that music stand and it just it really has it in a nice side of um of body for my eyes for me so that's what i really prefer um this one then clamps on here and it has a really nice attachment to the harp. My harp is carbon fiber, so I'm not really worried about ruining it because it's not really much which can ruin it, but it has nice felt insets and my husband made them for me. So you can also put it around wood harps without damaging them too much. And if anybody of you is really interested in that, we, can, we should chat afterwards privately via email or phone or something. I don't want to. Um, to take the time from everyone because this might not be of interest to everyone plus I would need to look up where I got it because it's this thing I have here is a contraption of three differently purchased things which over the years evolved into this one okay And about how to use an iPad for sheet music reading and arranging could be another chapter, which I have to do or share with others of you. I think it's just an amazing tool. And meanwhile, basically all but two of my students have also switched to, to iPad. It's a very nice way to, to annotating music. It's also nice to have, you have all your music always there when you need it. And don't need to schlep five, five folders somewhere or worry about wind blowing them over and all that. So yeah, I just saw some people are interested. Oh, yeah, maybe we can do it in the chat afterwards or somehow I need to collect 
those of the people who are interested email address or I give I'm sure on my handout is my email address so just email me in private or if not email Mary and then Mary can connect us so why does it show the kitchen now instead of me Um, yeah, questions we do later. Let me just continue here to, to the book. We are now in the chapter about the blocked and the broken chords. And that is for me sort of like this bad now but he really gets into pieces. It's still etudes, it's still exercises, but they could be all little tiny performance, performance pieces already. And some of them sound really similar to um, aquatans or automans, if you are already familiar with that. If not, I also will talk later about his other work. Um, but on the other hand, if you buy the Friandis book, you don't need to also buy a quatrain because although it's not the same, you have all the material already in a way. Here again, he doesn't give any indication about lift off or connecting or which fingers he wants to use. So I leave that up to you. What is intuitive? What makes more sense connecting or lift off? and which fingers to use. Um, I didn't write anything down here, but I'm sure you can figure that out for your students, for yourself. One of my favorite little pieces here is 57, which sounds very much, but not the same, like Autumn uh, Aquatans one. And here we are practicing block chords versus broken. So, I don't know, did I need to pay attention to anything there or should I just continue? You can just continue. No. Mm -hmm. So, we are now in the chapter which very introduces rhythms and special effects, not in one. So, first, a few pieces, rhythms, which remind me of his book, Pity Pa, if you know about that. The Pity Pa is basically a whole collection of pieces which are playable, also with, which are whole performance pieces, but relatively short, one to two pages. But basically each of those pieces introduces a different rhythm. So you have a rhythm exercise book in a nice, in a nice set of pieces. And that's here, the next few pieces in his chapter. I like that they're just much, much shorter than the one in Pedi Park. The first one I'm looking at now is number 68 not like the handout, I turned them around, but later I thought, oh, the levers are already in this position. So therefore, because the levers are already in this position, we start with 68, where he look, works on dotted rhythm or the turn around between short, long and long, short. Also one of those pieces where the rolls of the hands switch midway through. And one of the very typical Andre's um, way of dealing with music is 
you have an A section, then you have a B section, and it then goes da capo to the A section, which is just, it's A nice. You don't need to learn so much different things and it saves lots of space in the paper. Then number 67 has a very nice multi-rhythm exercise, which I really like. And it's a bit more challenging, so that's great teaching tool. And it sounds fun once you pull it off. I start slow. Let's see. Ah, no, that's not. Well, my hands. when the left hand gets the fast rhythm, then the rhythm in the right hand gets parallel, which makes it much easier than in the first section where left and right hand have different rhythms. That's really fun. So then in the same chapter, and I think he should have had two chapters, which more pieces in each, but in the same chapter, now he switches to the different um, sound techniques. Some of them which he invented, or at least he uses them a lot in his pieces. Um, but again, in this chapter, I think he should have done it much longer, much more different things. The first thing he chooses is sans silophonie, which is a harp, harp specific sound. And if you haven't encountered it yet, you can talk about that later. But this is his chapter about sans silophonie. And I like it because. He uses a combination of son naturel, the, the natural sound on the harp, and the and the silophonic sound, which come especially visible in number 69. I don't know if you can see all that. So that gets actually pretty challenging. It starts with the thumb playing the melody, which is fairly normal. That's sort of the easiest way of playing it. A little bit more challenging would be if you do three and four for, I try to show that here, three and four for the silophonic notes, and then one and two for the single notes. I probably cannot even pull that up now. Yeah, I, I would have to practice that too, which is also nice. I can always show my students, oh, look, I can't do that myself. I need to practice that also before pulling it off. In the second half, he switches to the thumb and the second finger playing the silophonic notes and then three and four playing the melody. Which makes it much more challenging. And nice little excursion. Hey, uh, Annette, can you hear me? Yes. Could you yes. do that again? I can't see where your hands are. Okay, let me pull the, put that in a different position. Yeah. Uh, maybe I need to uh, please disregard the kitchen. Mm -hmm. um, okay, that was the other one. So, so for silophony, uh, no, you can still not see it. For silophony, you put the fingers down on the strings. You muffle a little bit, but not completely. So you still want to hear a sound. So this is the regular sound. This is the muffled sound. If you press too much, you'd get hardly any sound. So you, so you touch it there to get this sort of xylophone like xylophone like sound. That's what it means. And then sony naturals are just the regularly played ones. So it's so the thumb plays the melody. And two and three just stay on those silophonic sound. 
And in the second half of the piece, that's where it gets really tr tricky. So the left hand stays on those two notes. It, it happens so in this piece, stays on those two notes the whole time. Left hand doesn't change and just covers those two notes to make them xylophone sounding. But now one and two play those. That means three and four have to share the melody. So it's. left hand part depending on which pieces are sometimes the left hand needs or that sometimes it's the right hand who gives us the syllophonic sound and the left hand plays it so it depends on the pieces he uses it for example a lot in ragazza that's one way i encounter it and in several of his pieces he has sometimes brief sections of this sans syllophonique it's just a fun sound it's a fun technique it's great to to work on that with students here he just has two pieces i think in that and another one he either invented or at least uses is pinch sound. So the French word is passé. Why is this not okay? So maybe a little bit farther away so you can see more. So this is where we take the string between one and two and pull. And depending what the piece or the thing is, sometimes you just alternate the hand really fast. Sometimes the other hand has to do something else. So in this case, the left hand plays a bass line. So the right hand has to do all the pinching. So you get the idea. And this is one of the rare exercises where he doesn't switch the hands inside the exercise. And there's no other piece which has the left hand pinching. So that's what I do then in my lessons is say, okay, now we switch. So then the left hand first alone gets to play the whole melody, either where it's written or an octave lower because it's left hand, probably slower, depending how fast the right hand was playing to get the pinch sound also in the left hand. And then, the really good brain teaser, switch your hands. Your right hand now plays the bass line and your left hand plays the melody line. That's if you want to really challenge your students or yourself to get this working. It's always nice to do those little brain teasers in between. And since Andres doesn't give us any indication, I just am sure he would approve of that because usually he switches his hands inside his pieces. Next chapter, uh, part of this chapter is soundboard percussion, which I'm sure you all have encountered already. Um, it's that's just a great teaching tool so if you haven't already used it in other pieces before then in with this book you could introduce it and sometimes he or other composers arrangers indicate exactly what to do use the flat hand use your finger use your knuckles or where but sometimes they don't and then you can experiment with your students what do they want to do what can they do here he just said he also translated into english hit on the body of the harp. That's all he says. So you can either say, oh yeah, I, I, I use my hand on the soundboard or I use it on the box uh, or I use my knuckles or I use fingers. So depending how your harp sounds, depending how your finger feels, depending how much time you have to do something, you can really experiment with that. And this little piece, he gives us also a little chords at the same time. Uh, that's experiment with that and then if in the section where you have two hands it's indicated left right left right left right but you could even change that and like how can you do it in one hand experiment all the freedom let your students invent something and that's really fun next chapter in the book is now that's the last chapter of the book which he titles it's about scales and, and crossing fingers 
And I would say it basically is little pieces. They have they have them already connected and he revisits several things he had earlier, be it block chords or be it intervals, be the interplay between the hands. Again, he doesn't give finger rings in this whole book. So you have, also apart from the one and two section. So you have to sort of invent your own and fingering is individual. So you can either find something which works best for your students or have intentionally say, yeah, I want you to play three to one, three to one throughout, or I want you to cross four to one, three to one. So in this piece, I already in the handout gave you two, uh, the two most intuitive or common ones as an example, you might come up with your own. So this starts with the left hand in intervals and the right hand in crossings. And then hands will switch. And you can hear it's just a lovely little piece, but it focuses on some specific exercise. So that was my overview over Friandis, which is really one of my, I was first, I, I have to admit the one reason why I bought it so late is the price is a bit steep, but I want to say is this re, it's really worth it. It's, it, it's, it gives you years and years and years of teaching material and it's just so pretty. And also probably hopefully for yourself to play and enjoy. And then I, for those of you who are not familiar with Bernard Andres, I wanted to just point out a few other books which I recommend as teaching material um, for, for beginners. It's Astes and Marels, who have short, like one page pieces, um, fairly easy to play. And they also focus on different things, on placing, on, on interplay between the hands, on, on small intervals and little scale segments, all wrapped into nice pieces. And then same idea, but then getting more and more advanced is charades and ribambel. And I don't even know if he calls them etude books, but I would call them etude books. They are nice little pieces, but they are mainly really all etudes focusing on something. And then books which have pieces in them, which could be used as etudes as practice thing or just as pieces are uh, aquatans for, for beginning intermediate. That again, that those words are also difficult to just qualify, but then automats is a little bit more advanced. Automats is a series of pieces in Baroque style, so they're very modern sounding, but each of them is to one of those typical Baroque dances, so it follows the, the rules of the rhythms and the, and the sections of those, so it's a whole little dance suite. And Petit Pas is, a, as I mentioned already earlier, is that with more advanced rhythm pieces, which each piece is just a beautiful piece and it's fun to work with students or to play on your own. There again, I group them usually in little suites. So I have the pieces with three flats all to put together or the pieces with two sharps all put together. So not in the order of the book. And then advanced pieces slash etudes are dance.com, which for those who like to play seasonal music, which I do, is this now just the right season to introduce or revisit dance.com which means dances in, in fall or autumn. And you can, they are, they are definitely more advanced. And Chanchette is an etude book with also fairly advanced exercises. All for lever harps. All what I had said so far fits on lever harps. Um, he also writes beautiful advanced music for paddle harp, which I used to play back long ago when I still played paddle harp, but I won't even get into those yet and leave that up to somebody else who specializes in paddle harp. But anyway, the, those are all like advanced students or advanced performance pieces and really, really wonderful. Um, I want to list the two ensemble books he has, which are also doable on lever harp and for intermediate to advanced players. The ads is all duos. And 
easily played even with beginners. Um, I sometimes play them where then students only play one hand and then I play the one hand of harp two and the other remaining harp of the other harp. Um, and that just, that works nicely. And then as soon as they advance enough to play both hands by themselves. It's, it's, and it's always also nice to revisit for advanced students because then you can basically just sight read it and have, have fun with something slightly challenging and just rewarding sounding. Ragazza is written as either an advanced duo where both players play two hands, which have pretty involved techniques and rhythms, or it's, you can also play it as a quartet where each harp plays one line. So one plays the right hand of harp one, one plays the um, left hand of harp one, and it's written like this, it's scored like that. So you can have it either as a quartet or as a duo. And that uses all of the aforementioned techniques, the uh, sans silo and, and pinched and uh, soundboard percussion and a few others. And it's just amazing. It's beautiful. If you're not familiar with it, I would say just Google it on YouTube or so, or iTunes. There are some great recordings available. You can listen to it. Like, yeah, that's that's something you should introduce to your ensembles. And yeah, this was this was it for me. So if there are any questions, I think we can open it now to questions and answers and I think I raced through it <laughs> because it took much less time and when I practiced it sorry I about that um, when you went to study with Andres where where did you go what part of France did you go and you I don't I've never met him I don't know anything really about him I've heard that he's a very quiet person and prefers not to be in public so can you just you know tell us about that and then can you translate some of those titles for us too yeah 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 um so yeah i met him in germany during a workshop it was a three-day workshop which was just just for him so so people who were interested in his work and yeah he was he's so mild-mannered very quiet and i think they even yeah they mentioned that he usually doesn't do in public and they somehow managed to to convince him to come to that town to Hanover and 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 promise that we would all be really nice to him and and it was a really yeah we were it was I don't know I forgot maybe 40 or 50 students were around there and we just yeah said quiet listen to him and it was partly him telling us about his works and he had meanwhile from published books, things which either they were writing misspelling mistakes, which he pointed out to us, or things where he said, meanwhile, oh, I want it faster, I want it slower, I rather want that repeat or not. So we all took notes and we're like, okay, this is what Andre said, this is how we should play it now. And we saw also sometimes ask questions. Also, I had before I came to the workshop marked in all my music, is that a mistake or did he want that? And can we play it like this and this? So we had all those, we can put talk about those things. So that was one subject. And then he did a master class. So we, each of us who wanted to had a piece prepared and he listened to it and, and, and he remarked on that. And then he gave he, together with some of the teachers who had organized that workshop, gave a concert in, in one of the evenings. So for me, it was just so amazing to finally meet him in person and, and see how how sweet he was with the little kids. I was already a grown up back then, but he the little kids who played, he was really nice. He, I think he's an amazing teacher also. And, and yeah, so it was so inspiring. And it was clear that the way how he even talked about his own music and the stuff so like he gives us the freedom to say hey we want to play this rather slower than he said or faster than he said or we want to change this note because he treats music also like that and that just give us the permission to to work on this music like that can you translate some of those titles like what does diads mean what does uh what does La Ragazza mean? What, what oh, does... La Ragazza is actually an Italian word. It means little children. And some words are invented words, and I don't know right now what the arts mean. I'm sure if I knew, I wrote it down somewhere. Aquatans mean watercolors. Automats means those little automats. Petipa means little steps, mainly dance, meaning dance steps. Yeah. Ribambel is, um, Mimarel is a carousel. No, Marel is hopscotch, right? When Marel is hopscotch, Ribambel is a, is a caro, carousel. Yeah, those are the ones I know out of the... And yeah, so some have a meaning, but 
often it's just so like friandise i think it fits perfectly because it means little delectables i just think this is perfect the others hopscotch ribambelle it's like yeah you you can take it like that it's a little playful pieces but it's not not necessarily has something to do with the contents of the music one of the favorite pieces which kurt and i play together is called al which means algae and it's yeah it's just beautiful it has sort of little images of watery stuff but not only that is originally written for oboe and harp and when we give our concerts because most of the music Kurt and I play Kurt plays clarinet for those of who were not there in the beginning um there is not very much composed for harp and clarinet other pieces which officially composed for harp and clarinet we don't even like or we can't play on lever or whatever so most of the things we arrange for ourselves and then sometimes we find pieces which are actually composed for harp and something. And Alx is one of those, which is originally for oboe. It sounds gorgeous on clarinet. Also on recorder, with Mummy, I play that together on recorder. She sometimes has to jump octaves because the range of the recorder is not so wide as the one of oboe or clarinet, but it sounds really nice. And it also sounds fun, not as nice, but fun on two harps. So I sometimes use it as, as lesson material with two harps, but you could play it with violin, with flute, with whatever. So that's definitely a big recommendation, Alg, by him. Well, I, Laura Brandenburg said that diads might mean seaweed, but she's not sure. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, yeah. that, that's interesting. And, uh, oh yeah, I wanted to point that out earlier and it's on who those of you who see the handout. Some colleagues of ours compiled a list translated into English of all his notations because they're so often, yeah, like when it said sans cilophonique, if you don't know what it means, if you don't know French, if you don't find it in the French dictionary because it's a harp invention <laughs> word, um, they compiled all those, trans said what it means and translated them into English. And it's free, free to download. So follow the link um, of that and, and, and enjoy that if you have several of oh, other French music, but Andre is definitely, it's meant for Andres, but you can use it for many other French composers also when they have those words. Well, does anyone else have any questions? Oh, okay. I'll Laura is saying that algae is seaweed. Yeah, it's algae. Uh, if algae is seaweed, no, no, related. <laughs> is that the oboe and harp one? That's the oboe and harp one, yes. We'll have to, I'll have to look into that. And one. I'm pretty sure I looked up the ads also, but I didn't memorize it and it might be. And some words are invented, so, but most of them mean something. Anna Dunwoody says that a dyad or a dyad is a group of two. Oh, right, yeah, that makes sense. That is a very nice title. <laughs> group. I like group thing. <laughs> we don't need Google. Well, we want to thank you so much. Uh, this was, I think I loved hearing about Andres and about what a good teacher he is and how good mm -hmm. he is with children. Because it's really important, I think, to, when you're playing music to know something about the composer. It, it makes, yeah. it makes yeah. playing the music so much better and and so much more meaningful so well uh actually i'm not the host of this i turned the host over to gretchen <laughs> Monson. for some reason my zoom is not acting properly either but you know if anyone does anyone have any questions i'm i'll find out about the um how i see if robin has a question or well, at least he waves at me hey. <laughs> Maybe i thought it was a hand clap I was just trying to clap oh, my hands. Oh, yeah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> this was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you yeah, you're welcome. Much. I enjoyed that. And yeah, thank you again, Mary, to give me the opportunity to have a full session because originally it was planned for August and I was really sick then and I would have had only 20 minutes. So I'm very glad <laughs> give the chance to really deep, deep dive into this book. Yeah, well, we really appreciate it too. I think it's really nice to go into one book and learn a lot about one individual book. Well, if there are no other questions, we wanna extend our thanks to you for giving your time to us today. Yeah. I learned a lot. Um, I'll get back with you about that, um, how you hook your iPad to your mm -hmm. to your harp. That's really interesting. So 
Okay, well, I think then in that case, we'll just bid you a, how do you say goodbye in French? <laughs> Adieu. <laughs> Adieu. <laughs> Au revoir. <laughs> Merci beaucoup. <laughs> uh, de rien. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. And Gretchen, yeah, I think you welcome. can sign us off. <laughs> Bye, okay, Kira. Thank Thanks for coming and listening. <laughs>